I'm just working this all together. Uh, but we're going to talk about encouragement. But there's an old story about a preacher. This preacher was leaving his church. And at the uh, farewell dinner, he was trying to encourage one of the old pillar members. And he said, don't be sad. Next time, this pre the preacher might be better than me. And she replied, that's what they said the last time. But it keeps getting worse. Encouragement. <laughs> 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 Not exactly encouragement. <laughs> he was trying to encourage her, um, but it didn't happen that way. I, I don't have to explain too hard that we need encouragement. We, we face challenges at every turn. I mean, let's take a look at our world right now. It seems out of control. Um, and, and there's challenges all over the place. We need people in our lives that are going to come alongside of us and encourage us. Uh, what do people need when they're struggling? Well, stop it. Just get out of it. Come on. No, they need encouragement. They need someone to come alongside them and encourage them. What do people need when they need to be challenged to do something they might seem out of their normal range or ability? They need someone to come alongside and say, you can do it. See, Mark, you can do it. You're doing great. Hey, Mark's, Mark's got this. you got a new, new guy here. <laughs> <laughs> what about uh, uh, when they have children, or when you have children, and they make their first attempts at walking? You say, come on, dummy, you should be walking by now. Get up. <laughs> no, I have a 16-month-old, and he's not quite walking yet, but he's, he's standing, and he's shuffling alongside of the couch. So we, we try to encourage him to, come on, you can do it. it it's not as scary as it seems. Um, what about when someone's struggling with their faith? What do they need? They need encouragement. They need someone to come alongside and say, it's okay. You're not worthless. Jesus Christ went to the cross, as Steve was just talking about. Jesus paid it all. We can do it. He forgives even those of us who mess up. They don't need us to just ignore them and hope that they get better. Uh, so let's look at the, the uh, definition. You can sort of follow me in, in the, the uh, bulletin here um, and the PowerPoint if it sort of all works together in that way. If not, who cares? Um, <laughs> I really don't. I, I told Mark, I don't ever look at the PowerPoint when I preach it. Now, now it's in front of me, so I see it. But it's always behind me, and I pay no attention to it. So if it works, it works. But uh, it's just one of those things. What is encouragement? Is encouragement being critical about everything? Sometimes we have people in our lives that are just sort of critical about everything. That's not encouragement. To encourage, we're on uh, A there, to come alongside of. To encourage means to come alongside of. If we're going to encourage each other, we need to come alongside them. It means to come alongside, to walk with them, to, to get where they are, and to come alongside. The word can mean to urge, or admonish, or caution them. So sometimes encouragement means, hey, I, I see where you're going, and it's not the best way. I, I have been there, I've done that, let me, let me show you. It's not, hey, dummy, you shouldn't be going this way. It's let me, let me encourage and admonish you to go the right way. So encouraging, it, the root word for encouragement comes from the same word that Jesus used for the Holy Spirit several times. In John 14, uh, 16, and, and John 15, he used it several times of the Holy Spirit as an encourager alongside of us. And you know the Holy Spirit comes alongside of us and says, hey, you shouldn't be going this way. Let me, let me encourage you back in this direction. Uh, an important part of encouraging is the willingness, as I said, to step in with them, to get in the trenches with them. It's one thing to kind of stand above and say, hello, hey, you should probably go this way. Or it's another thing to kind of jump down in the trenches and say, let me walk with you. I want to show you the way to go. Well, this morning in the passage, we're going to talk about a man named Barnabas. And this is point B on there. Barnabas was known as the son of encouragement. What a cool name to be known as. The son of encouragement. I would love to be known as that. That people, when people thought of me, they thought of, oh, wow, he's going to come encourage. Uh, but that's what Barnabas. He was a person, he must have been inspiring. Uh, Paul worked with him. Now, if you know anything about Paul in the Bible... Paul was a, uh, he, he pushed, he, he was rough, he, he spread the gospel to very hard areas, he was beat, imprisoned, uh, but he was a hard pusher, um, and I think he needed Barnabas next to him to be the soft, 
to be the encourager, to say, let's keep going. And, and to others around, Paul might have just walked over some people, and, and Barnabas came along and said, come on, he means well. You know anybody like Paul in your life? They're just kind of, they're great people, but they push. Um, and so I believe Barnabas was right there with him to help along. So we're going to read now in, in uh, Acts 15, uh, 30 to 35 here. And this is right after, uh, I better put this in context. There was the, the Gentiles, the Jews and the Gentiles. The Gentiles had just come to faith in Jesus. And the Jews were saying, well, shouldn't they be circumcised? And shouldn't they not eat this meat? And all the laws that the Jews had to keep. And they were trying to see if they had to enforce those on the Gentiles. And so the leaders met and had this, you know, their meetings as they met. And they, they, came, they came in unison that, no, we're not going to place these upon the Gentiles. God's grace is sufficient. It covered it all. And so this letter is now being brought back to the church. And this is where we pick up at verse 30. So when they were sent off, they went down to Antioch. And having gathered the congregation together, they delivered the letter. And that when they had read it, they rejoiced because of its encouragement. And Judas and Silas, who were there, who were themselves prophets, encouraged and strengthened the brothers with many words. And after they had spent some time, they were sent off in peace by the brothers to those who had sent them. But Paul and Barnabas remained in Antioch, teaching and preaching the word of the Lord with many others also. How do we encourage others? How do we encourage others? Well, one of the biggest encouragements is, is from this passage, and it's called freedom in Christ. Freedom in Christ is encouraging. That's a 2A there, if you're following on your outline. Freedom in Christ is encouraging. You see, their overwhelming joy as they read this letter was to understand that all the apostles were in full accord. They, they agreed that this new covenant was Christian liberty. No longer did they have to have the old covenant because Jesus Christ had come and given the new covenant. It wasn't a matter, they didn't discard the whole Old Testament and say, oh, that's not important. It, it was a matter that the Old Testament was used as a tool for instruction. But as long as it was used lawfully. You see, in light of the new covenant, our salvation is through grace. It's not through circumcision. It's not through what we can eat and what we can't eat. Uh, and so there was, there was encouragement. There was excitement at the freedom that we have in Christ. Galatians 5.1 For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to the yoke of slavery. slavery. You see, Jesus came to set us free. Jesus didn't come to set free all these laws and regulations on us. That was already done through Moses. That was God's covenant, the initial covenant, that we could never fulfill. We could never obtain it. And that was the whole point of it. We could never gain our, our entrance into heaven on our own by the old covenant. Jesus fulfilled that covenant. The new covenant was to set us free. Colossians chapter 1, 22, 21 and 22. And you... Who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds. He has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death, in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. What encouragement! There is nothing that you and I can do to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Jesus Christ did it all. We were, we were hostile, we were evil, we were not thinking rightly. Many of you uh, may or may not see that. Oh, is that not going through? If it doesn't, no worries. Um, many of us were, were uh, we were not thinking godly thoughts. But Jesus came, Christ came down in flesh, went to the cross, and gave it all for us. In fact, we read in Romans 8, the first four verses. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do, by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin. He condemned sin in the flesh in order 
that the righteous requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. When we begin to understand that we no longer are condemned by our sins, but we are freed by what Jesus Christ did, He came down and took away the penalty of the law. He came down and released us from that. We are not condemned by it. We are free. To me, that's encouraging. I hope it is to you. So if you want to encourage someone, talk to them about the freedom that we have in Christ. It's not freedom to do anything we want, although we can, uh, but we have to be sensitive to each other and our own struggles and weaknesses. But we are free in Christ, not held by the covenant law of the Old Testament. We are free to worship. We are free to, to, to teach, to, to dance. No, don't spread that one around um, in the Baptist church. But, uh, but we're free to, to worship our Savior. And we are not held by the customary laws of the Old Testament. All right, so the first way is freedom in Christ is encouraging. The second is to give others a second chance. Give others a second chance. This is verse 36 through 30, or 41 here of Acts 15. So this is the Paul and Barnabas stayed in Antioch and were teaching and preaching. And after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, Let us return and visit the brothers in every city where we proclaim the word of the Lord and see how they are. Now Barnabas wanted to take with them John, called Mark. But Paul thought it best not to take with them the one who was withdrawn from them in Paphilia and had not gone with them to, to the work. And there arose a sharp disagreement. So that they separated from each other. And Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus. But Paul chose Silas and departed, having been commended by the brothers to the grace of the Lord. And he went through Syria and Sicilia, strengthening the churches. Well, I don't have to remind you, but Christians disagree a lot. I'm sure you've seen that within, within the church often. Christians disagree about almost Anything. In fact, even me coming up here and saying, well, we used to have a snack break. Why, why don't we have a snack break anymore? I don't like that, you know. It's at the end. Oh, it's at the end. Okay. <laughs> I saw cake in there. You know, <laughs> my Aunt Mary brought cake. <laughs> but we do disagree. I heard this story a few years ago about a man who had been uh, rescued after many years of living alone on a desert island. He, uh, when he's picked up, the captain says to him, I thought you were stranded alone. I was, replied the castaway. Well, then why are there three huts on the beach? Well, the first one is my house. <clears throat> and the second one is where I go to church. Well, what about the third one? Oh, that's my old church. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Even alone, <laughs> we disagree with something, you know. Um, I, if you uh, if you look at Wikipedia ever on online and you type in a list of Christian denominations, oh my goodness, the list is huge. I mean, you've got all kinds of um, Orthodox churches, Catholic churches, uh, Lutheran denominations, Methodist churches, Anglicans, Presbyterians, Pentecostals, Charismatics, and then there's the Baptists. <laughs> Southern Baptist, American Baptist, Conservative Baptist, Baptist General Conference, National Baptist, uh, Progressive Baptist, and then there's Old Baptist Union, Old Regular Baptist, Old Time Missionary Baptist, General Association of Baptists, General Association of General Baptist, General Association of Regular Baptist Church, General Six Principal Baptist, and Two Seed in the Spirit Predestination Baptist. <laughs> um, obviously, we disagree a lot. <laughs> and when we disagree, we form another church. That's just generally what happens within. That's why there are so many denominations. Even in, even in, in Woodland, uh, there have been many church plants from, from splits. Many of you have probably been a part of, of some of those. Uh, out here, I don't know too many uh, that have, have split off, but I don't know that history out here too well but so we have we have disagreements and, and in our passage we see that John Mark 
and Paul and Barnabas were in this disagreement. You see, in the first journey, the first missionary journey earlier in Acts, uh, John Mark left Paul and Barnabas. We don't know if he was homesick, they were going to go on to do more, more church planting, but he left and we don't know why. Um, Paul didn't like that very well. Paul remembered that John Mark left. And so now Paul says, let's go back and visit those churches that we helped start and let's encourage them. And uh, except, let's not bring John Mark. And Barnabas says, no, I want to bring John Mark. And Paul says, no, I'm not to the point where there's a strong disagreement. I don't know what that means. Uh, biblically speaking, I have a feeling that there were words uh, spoken that, that aren't, they're not going to write in here. Um, possibly sin had happened here uh, amongst them. Whatever the case, they decided it best, instead of fighting it out, to separate. And it's okay to do that sometimes. I make fun of the variety of churches, but sometimes we need to, when, when there's such a sharp disagreement, we do need to separate and, and conquer more, actually. Uh, what ended up happening, there was two groups that went out and ministered. Um, but, you know, if it was up to Paul, John Mark failed. He was done. Sorry, John. You, you uh, left us, and, and uh, maybe you should go back to whatever you were doing before. Uh, but, but Barnabas, Barnabas saw something in him. Barnabas, remember, the son of encouragement, said, I will take him, and I will, I will work with him. I will give him a second chance. I will teach and train him and encourage him. Uh, that's exciting. The question is, do you know anyone who could use a second chance? Sometimes we're like Paul. And we say, nope, sorry, they burned me. They're done. But we need people like Barnabas to say, you know what, it's okay. Let me, let me work with you. Let's see what's going on here and see if we can help. All right, so let's get on to the, the third point here. Why should we encourage others? Why should we encourage others? How do we do this? We do this to keep the faint-hearted from quitting. To keep the faint-hearted from quitting. Point A there. Acts 11, 22 and 23. It says, The report of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. What report came to them? The report was that there was... Uh, there was persecution going on in the church. And, and they sent Barnabas to go find out what's going on over there in Antioch. When he came and saw the grace of God, he was glad. And he exhorted them to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose. You see, Barnabas, the stun of encouragement again, was resolute. He was telling them to stay true. Stay true. I know it's tough. I know you're going through a hard time. Stay true. Sometimes when we're ready to quit the faith, someone comes along and says, keep on keeping on. You know, I, I, I've thought a lot about people who, who were like this, um, and, and I can't help but come, always coming back to my parents were, were both ones that just kept telling me, keep on keeping on. If you know anything about me, I was a horrible student uh, in school. I did not like school. Um, I did not do well in school. And, uh, Amen. <laughs> and I know my parents were frustrated, uh, but I can, I can remember my mom and, and my dad just saying, keep on, keep on, Dave. You can do this. God has called you to something greater. Don't quit. And, and uh, eventually, even at, at age, uh, what was I, 39, was able to finally graduate and get my degree. It took a long time, but a lot of encouragement to, to keep on. Are, are we able to pull that video up, or is that, we have sound? We might. We might. Okay. <laughs> That'll be probably next. There. There's a video of, from the movie Facing the Giants that goes along with this. <coughs> but it didn't play when it came up. It's playing there, but not here. That's all right. We didn't test the sound before. That's okay. We can we can skip over that. It's, it's not too big of a deal. I can describe it. I've watched this a million times. <laughs> okay. So so we have we have this football team here, and the coach uh, is, is trying to get them. They've been losing a lot and just really frustrated and down, ready to give up and quit. 
and, and there's one man on this team that was influential of the whole team. So he called him out and says, come on, let's do the death crawl. Now the death crawl was getting down on your hands and knees, carrying a 140 pound player on your back and seeing how far you can go. And he said, I, I want you to go to the 50 yard line. And uh, the guy said, I don't know if I can make it. He says, I don't care, just do your very best. And then he put a blindfold on him. He says, why are you blindfolding me? He says, I don't want you to quit when you get to a certain point. I want you to give me your very best. And so that, you know, it starts going, he's crawling. And, and, and the, the point of the fact is the coach, he eventually gets down on his hands and knees. And, and, he's, and he's yelling at this guy and encouraging him. He says, you can do it. The guy says, it hurts. And he says, I know it hurts. Let it burn. And he just keeps going. Eventually, the guy goes, actually, the whole hundred yards of the football field, carrying a 160-pound man uh, guy on his back. And his point was, if you feel discouraged and let down, your whole team will be. But if you give your very best, you know, we'll, we'll see what God can do. And the coach was just like what, what we're talking about, someone to encourage. He got down in the trenches. He was actually crawling with this guy, saying, keep on, you can do it. Now, without him, this football player probably would have stopped long before. He said, ah, it hurts, I'm, I'm done, I'm gonna give up. Uh, but, but no, with the coach right there encouraging, saying, don't quit, keep going, he kept going. So Thessalonians 5.14 tells us the same thing. And we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient, with them all. We don't want people to go back to their old way of life. We don't want to see people just quit because life is tough. We want to encourage them. You can do it. Keep on keeping on. And the second point here is to draw out potential <laughs> in others. Oh, there it is. <laughs> Minus the sound. <laughs> Get on the next. So, to draw out potential in others. I've got two stories from the Bible here of, of people drawing out potential in others. And the first is, is one of my favorite. It's the story of Joshua. We named our firstborn son Joshua uh, because uh, Joshua was one of those men that, that God said, uh, be strong and courageous. I'm going to be with you no matter where you go. And uh, Joshua had been, if you know the story, he'd been at Moses' side for a long time. He'd been walking with Moses. He'd been learning from Moses. Um, and now it's going to be Joshua who's going to lead the people into the promised land. Moses uh, was banned by God because of his temper. Some of us may have tempers in here. Uh, mm -hmm. Moses let his shine through. And, and because of that, he couldn't enter the promised land. Uh, but in, in Deuteronomy chapter 1, 36, 37 through 39, says this, Even with me... The Lord was angry on your account. This is Moses speaking. And said, you shall not go in there. Joshua, the son of Nun, who stands before you, he shall enter. Encourage him, for he shall cause Israel to inherit it. You see, Moses was saying, encourage Joshua. Encourage him, because you can help draw his potential. Joshua is going to become a great leader. He's going to lead you into the promised land. He's going to do mighty things. In fact, we know that he did. One of the first things is, is the walking around Jericho. And the wall, the song, and the walls came tumbling down. Uh, but, but Moses was there to draw potential. And he said, he, he told everybody, encourage him. Encourage him as he leads you. Now the second uh, story from the Bible is what we're talking about this morning. is John Mark. Again, John Mark was, uh, had, had left, had abandoned Paul. Paul was mad at him, I think. Sounded like it. Um, but interestingly enough, later we read something about Paul and John Mark. In uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 11, Paul says this, Luke alone is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he is very useful to me and for ministry. Wow. Is this the same John Mark that he said, nah, I, don't, I don't want him to come along? It is. It's the same guy. And now he says, get him and bring him because he's useful for ministry. What happened? 
what happened was Barnabas. Remember, Barnabas took him and encouraged him and helped him grow. What would have happened if it wasn't for Barnabas? Now, Mark probably would have just gone back home and gone back to whatever he was doing and just sort of given up. Well, well, Paul doesn't like me, so I guess I'm not supposed to do this ministry thing. Uh, But no, Barnabas came alongside and says, no, wait a minute, I see potential in this guy. And so much so that later, Paul wanted him with him. The very man he wanted to push away, he now wanted with him and said he's very useful to me. How can encouragement draw out potential? Well, in so many different ways. If you encourage someone, who knows what God can do through that person. We all need that encouragement as we get down and we get frustrated. The third way, to help people see God in the tough times. To help people see God in the tough times, part 3C there. To help people see God in the tough times. The tough times do hit. I don't have to tell most of you that. You know that. We have struggles. Things happen. Um, people in, in Texas know that very well. Uh, the tough times have hit, um, and, and they're dealing with it. The tough times hit in our families, and our communities, um, even simply the weather. Uh, just just uh, been texting my sister back and forth to make sure they're surviving in San Jose. It was 108 there yesterday, and they don't have air conditioning. Um, and so, uh, tough times hit. It's, it's hard sometimes. Um, but we can encourage people when those tough times hit. Romans 8.28, always a go-to verse for encouragement. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to His purpose. Now, I don't want to mistranslate this verse. We're not saying that because you know God, life is good. We don't have problems. No, it says all things work together for good. Tough times happen. Things happen that that we don't understand. I I know just standing here this morning, of course, this has brought all the the emotions back of of my father. and, And I don't understand it. I really don't understand it. He was young still, and, and in his prime preaching the Word of God, and people were following him, and I needed him, my children needed him, my mom needed him. Why would God take him? I don't know. But I do know that all things work together for good, and that's been a sustaining, aside from my own mother and her joy word, <laughs> has been a sustaining fact amongst this of, how, why, why do things happen? We don't know. But we do know that God works all things for good. In fact, in James chapter 1, 2 through 4, it says, Count it all joy, my brothers, if you fa- no, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and that steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete lacking in nothing. He says, count it all joy when you face trials of many kinds. You're going to face trials of many kinds. I'm going to face trials of many kinds. Our life is not smooth and peachy like some, um, some TV preachers want you to think. That, that give your life to God and all is good. And that's not true. Give your life to God and He is good. But we're still mm-hmm. going to go through trials. But when we go through that, it produces steadfastness. And steadfastness produces you to be perfect and complete. How can we be perfect and complete in Christ? Go through the trials. That's what does it for us. It helps us turn our face and our mind towards Jesus Christ. And we can help each other when we see each other going through the hard times. Bring the scripture. Bring the encouragement. Say, God is doing... Don't, don't, you don't have to be cheesy and say, well, you know, I don't know. I'm not going to go there. But uh, bring the scripture that God is still on the throne. He is still in charge. And encourage them. Which leads to the next point. To strengthen others. Why should we encourage others to strengthen others? We should always be help, trying to help others have a stronger faith. That should be our goal. We should be meeting together outside of 
uh, of church and, and trying to strengthen each other. Uh, Proverbs 27, 17 says, Iron sharpens iron as one man sharpens another. Are we investing in each other? Are we sharpening each other? Because when we meet together, go out for coffee or donuts or whatever you like and, and encourage each other, sharpen each other, to strengthen each other. And finally, the last point there, to strengthen the church community. We are to encourage each other to strengthen the church community. There is no more encouragement that I know than to get yourself in church on a Sunday morning. I have been to many different churches. We, we go on vacation. We show up at a church because I need that encouragement as much as anybody else does. We, uh, Hebrews 10, 24 and 25 talks about this. And let us consider how to stir one another up to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as in the habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. We need this encouragement. The day is drawing near. I don't have to remind you of that. You can watch the news. You can try to figure it out when Jesus Christ is returning. I don't know. But I know he is. Amen. And I know that our world is struggling. I know our communities are struggling. They don't know Jesus. And I know that when we get out there, it's exhausting. It's tiring. It's frustrating. Mm -hmm. And that's when we come together. We meet on a Sunday morning, and we come together and we encourage each other. We have cake together. We enjoy each other because we're encouraging one, one another. We can also encourage each other with Scripture. I don't think there's any better way to encourage than with Scripture. My, uh, my life verse, well, at this point, I change life verses. I don't know if any of you do that. <laughs> it is now Proverbs 3, 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will make your paths straight. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. If I trust in the Lord with all my heart, that means my heart can't be elsewhere. That means I can't be focused on other things. That means I give everything to Him, and not lean on my own understanding. You know, I was mentioning when my, when my dad was dying, and I was trying to explain this to my children. I have four children. Of course, our baby doesn't understand anything. But um, it's, it's uh, how how do we deal with this? How do we how do we wrap our heads around this? And I, and I explained to them my understanding is that this shouldn't be happening. I don't like this. This isn't good. But I said, but we always have to go back to trusting in the Lord because He directs our paths. He makes our paths straight. He is the one that is going to lead us. He is our encouragement. And it was, it was fun, actually. In the midst of this, it was fun to, to teach my children and at the same time I'm teaching myself how to, to walk through things like this, uh, knowing that God is in charge. I want to leave us with one final passage this morning. Many of us are tired. Can't really see it on your faces. You guys look away. Sometimes in church we look tired, but uh, we're tired from life. We're tired from what's happening. We're tired from stress. Tired from heat. We're tired from floods. We're tired. We're worn out. Uh, life is hard. Uh, but, but Jesus gives us this beautiful passage and it's in the book of Matthew chapter 11 um, and it's 28 to 30 and I'm going to read this from the, the message paraphrase. The message is not a translation, it's a paraphrase of Eugene Peterson. Um, sometimes, sometimes he seems like he's way off on it. Sometimes he seems like he gets it. And so I like it sometimes. Um, but here's Matthew 11, 28 to 30. Are you tired? Worn out? Burned out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me. And you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. That's what I want. I want to learn how to live as Jesus lives. I want to walk with him. I want that unforced rhythm of grace. 
It's the most beautiful thing. And we need to be encouraging each other with passages like this. Meet together. Encourage each other. Bring the scriptures out. Email each other. Facebook each other. Whatever it is, encourage one another with God's word. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this morning. I thank you for uh, just being here. God, it's a holy place to be when we're in your presence. And I'll take that for granted. Lord, I thank you for encouragement. I thank you for what you did on the cross. There's no bigger encouragement than that. You gave it all for me. Father, teach me, teach this church how to walk as you walk in the unforced rhythm of grace and to rest in you and to be encouraged by you and to encourage their community and their family, Father. Just thank you for uh, bringing us here this day. Thank you for uh, buildings like this, for for simple things like air conditioners, Lord, that, that keep us comfortable. But most of all, thank you for your grace. Thank you that this is all about you and what you did. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.